Hello, everyone, and welcome. Tonight, we are going to be showing you how to use iNaturalist for our super fun summer Nevada nature blitz. If you haven't downloaded the app yet, you can download it on Google Play or the App Store on Apple or um, uh, Android phones on these pictures here. And uh, it will help you if you download them now. You don't have to, but as we go along tonight, we're gonna to be testing it out a little bit. So if you have it on your phone or your tablet, that will be very helpful. So I have here tonight, my name is Julie Bless and I work for the Nevada Department of Wildlife. I am our wildlife education coordinator, and I also am on the board of Nevada Bugs and Butterflies. And I am joined tonight with Cynthia Shaw, who uh, works for the Nevada, the U University of Nevada Reno Museum of Natural History. And she is also the co-founder of Nevada Bugs and Butterflies. So we've got a lot going on today, lots of partners. And we're gonna show you how to use this really cool app, how to log observations on your smartphone called iNaturalist. So how it works. Well, number one, you have to get outside. So you go outside, you take a picture with your phone um, or, or with an actual camera, you can do that too. Oh, and before I get too much farther, I wanna make sure that everyone knows that you can use the chat box or the Q&A function to ask either of us questions. If you do use the chat function, please change the setting. There's a little arrow at the top of the chat box and please change it so that you are sending it to all panelists and attendees so that other people can see what you're putting as well. So back to what we were talking about is how it works. So you wanna record your observation, you need to get outside, um, you need to take a picture and then you can share it on the app to other naturalists. And then there's a social aspect. So other people can help identify what you found. And if your uh, finding, your observation is, uh, is identified by someone else, it can actually become research grade. So it's a species occurrence recording tool, it's crowdsourcing, and the main goals of this app are to connect people with nature, enhance understanding of life on earth, and encourage people to value life on earth. And Cynthia is actually going to talk more about what, how these observations are used later on, which is really cool. So who are you in iNaturalist? Are you an observer? You probably will be. That is someone who documents and records something that you find outside using photos or sounds, or you can be an identifier. So if you're an expert at any living thing, you can go into the app and help other people ID things. And that helps improve the quality of the records of others. And you can agree or disagree on suggested species too, which is pretty cool. So iNaturalist is made up of citizen or community scientists and biologists, and Cynthia's going to talk more about that too, who are experts in their field and everything in between. Like me, I'm everything in between. I am an observer and sometimes I am an identifier. But by getting all these different people involved, we end up with way more sightings entered, there's more verified sightings, and we have a bigger understanding of diver biodiversity within, um, within our, our Earth. So what information is important to, app, to have? And the app will automatically put all of this in there. So you make an iNaturalist account, and you don't have to use your real name. You can use a handle. You don't have to put very much personal information if you don't want to. And then you can post anything that you want. You can choose a group of organisms if you want. Um, when you take a picture, it will let you try and identify it. You can also put other things, other evidence, and then you can post it for the community. Um, where you saw it, the app automatically records uh, the coordinates of where you were 
if you let it, you don't have to. You can also obscure your location if you want to. When you saw it, the app will automatically do that and evidence of what you saw. So that again, if you have any other evidence, you can put that into your, um, into your observations. And that is what we, I am going to be covering at the beginning of this is how to make an observation. So number one, you have to download it or you can use your desktop. So you can use either or, you don't have to use it on your phone, but you need to download it or go to the website, which is inaturalist.org. You need to create an account and join our project. Really important to join our project. You don't have to join projects, but we really would like you to join our project. Then using your smartphone or your or a, an actual camera, because you can upload observations on your desktop, you can use a regular camera. Um, you can add in details through the app, then you can save and upload your observation and then when you're done, you can go back and check your observation and see what other people are saying in the community. So installing on your device, this is the same um, graphic that was at the very beginning. And so that's very easy. Just type in iNaturalist. It has that green bird flying. If you see that, you're in the right spot. And you can create your account you create your username, you use an email, you create a password, just like anything else. And then this is where you would log in when you're ready. So once you've got your account created, this is what your homepage will look like. And this is not my homepage. This is actually someone else's. Um, that's not my username. So I'm being, I'm going incognito a little bit. But this is what your user page looks like. And that's if you click that little me button down at the bottom. That is where um, all of your observations are. You can see there is this, the Valley Carpenter Bee, Dark Eyed Junko. Those are all observations that have been made. And you can also see um, that there's been comments made on this, on the, uh, on the homepage and how long ago they were made. And you can see different locations. So these are all of your observations. Now, if you want to join our, um, our project, you need to go down to the bottom of your screen where there are these three dots right here. And that's gonna take you to a screen that looks like this. And projects, we're looking for projects. So that's where you go. And the name of our project is the Summer Nevada Nature Blitz, and you will find it in this list. You can easily search it, um, or if you're if you're in Nevada, it will probably show up if you do this nearby as well. Um, but also, if you want to join other projects, like this actually is mine. Um, like I have scorpions of California because one time I found a scorpion in California, so that got added to that project. So there's lots of projects. You can join um, last year's Nevada Bugs and Butterflies project. Lots and lots of fun things. I always like to check back into the projects to see if there's anything that I want to join. Oh, and I did not change the text on this. So you want to join our Summer Nevada Nature Blitz, which looks like this. And where that leave button is, uh, it should say join because this is my account. It, uh, it says leave because I'm already in the project, but that's where you hit if you wanna join. And then after you join, you can go back to your home page by just hitting this arrow right here. And what we're gonna do next is we are going to make an observation together. So you do that by taking a picture and this links with your camera. So if you have it on your phone, you should pull your app up right now so that we can test it out a little bit. So when you hit that observation button, let me get back to my home page. When you hit observe, it's going to take you to another screen and you can do no photo. Um, you can take a photo 
or you can use your camera phone. And actually looking at these screenshots, these screenshots look even different because it is updated. The app has already updated. So what you should see, the light isn't quite right here, is there are actually four options and one of them is recording a sound. So you can do no, no photo, you can use your camera, you can go into your camera roll. So if someone sent you a photo or if you saw something, you can go into your uh, camera roll, say you weren't ready to make an observation and you can use a photo that you already have. Sometimes I do that when people send me something that they want identified and I'll throw it into iNaturalist and see what they're saying. I usually delete it before I submit it though. So, um, and you can record a sound and I apologize, not this isn't as updated as I thought it would be. They must have just done a recent update, which is pretty cool. So we are gonna do the one where you're taking a photo right now. So when you have your phone out and you're ready, it should look like you're about to take a photo. And we're gonna test it out with this screen here. If you take a photo of your screen, I'm gonna do it too. And then it should say, use photo. So hopefully you all took a picture. I'll give you a little bit more time. So after you take your photo, which you do by taking the, uh, tapping the green circle, you are going to click use photo. Or next, if that's what you see. And then you should see this screen. So if you got multiple photos of whatever it is that you saw, you can add more by clicking this right here and adding more photos. And then next is we wanna see what suggestions are. So if you click this right here, you will get suggestions of things that have been seen nearby potentially, or just other pictures that may have looked like the picture that you have. And so you'll see, we know this was probably a ladybug or a lady beetle, a really common species for us. And when you click that, hopefully you're getting the same thing. Mine also said oblong lady beetles as a suggestion. It also helps if, so the first thing that's coming up on there isn't what you think it is to scroll through what those other suggestions are. You can also search. Um, I know iNaturalist is not super good at identifying spiders, for example. You have to have a really good picture of a spider. And even if you do, sometimes it won't get to quite the right observation. Um, so a lot of times I'll end up having to search the right genus to even get to the right thing to put on there. You can also put nothing, or if it's something that you don't know, I'll just put what the top suggested, sub suggested thing is. And then other people in iNaturalist will be like, that is definitely not what it is. And hopefully will give me the right answer. Um, so you choose lady beetles, now it shows up. You please don't add this observation, just you can still go through it, but don't add it because you didn't actually see it. And it's not a uh, it's not a legitimate observation. This is just for practice. But if you did click it, you would see that your observation shows up here, and uh, you can also add notes at the bottom here. You want to make sure that your uh, it's the right date. If you want to change the location, if the location isn't quite right, geo privacy, if you want your location shown or not, whether it's captive or cultivated, that's important to know. Um, it's not great. iNaturalist is not for adding um, captive animals or cultivated plants, for example, like you, if you had chickens going into your backyard and taking a bunch of pictures of your chickens and then uploading those, not helpful to the community don't do that. <laughs> Same with any plants in your garden. Those do not need to be uploaded. Um, that is not what this is for. We want to keep 
what we're seeing as um, natural as possible. Now, that does mean that maybe you'll have observations of invasive species or non-native species. That's totally okay. That's actually really good information to have. Um, but we want to make sure that you are using uh, you you are using something that is specifically not cultivated or captive. It's something wild. And if you join our project, if you're in Nevada, it will automatically upload to our project. Now, if you had gone through the whole process and you did upload the, uh, the observation, this is what it would look like. And if you make an observation when you don't have service, it will save it to your phone and then eventually upload it. So this did get uploaded, so please don't upload this. And you can see it shows up on your me page where all of your um, where all of your observations are. So that's how you make an observation. It's pretty easy. And something that's really cool about iNaturalist is that the more species that get uploaded, the better the ID gets if you can get a good photo, which Cynthia is going to talk about those good photos. So just to recap, you need to download iNaturalist. You can do it on your iPhone, your Android, or you can just go to iNaturalist.org on your computer. You need to create an account um, using your smartphone or a camera. You don't have to use just a smartphone. You, you can use a regular camera and use the, um, the desktop version. Just go online. Then you can add details into your observation and uh, definitely check out those suggested species IDs. Then you can save it and upload it. And then when you're done, the fun part is going back and seeing who has identified your picture or commented. So any questions about that? Go ahead and ask any questions in the chat if you need to. And I'm gonna give a couple seconds here before we move on because we're gonna talk about um, seek before we move on to Cynthia. I, actually, Cynthia, is there anything else you want to add before we move on to the seek? No, <clears throat> I think that sounds great. Uh, there are a few, if you really get into identifying or sometimes if you can't figure out how to do something on the app, I will say that there are things like messaging people that are much easier on the desktop version. So if this is something that really interests you, you want to know more about maybe how it works, um, see all the observations on a bigger screen, it is sometimes very nice to look at it on a desktop. I totally agree. I like using both. Also, some people get really good photos. So seeing them on a big desktop screen is much nicer than just scrolling through your phone. Okay, so we are going to talk about another app, which is called Seek. And Seek is a companion app to iNaturalist. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on it because it is even more simple than iNaturalist. So if you know how to use iNaturalist, Seek is going to be a breeze. Um, Seek talks to iNaturalist. So you sign in with your iNaturalist account. And this is what it looks like. It's very simple. Seek is definitely marketed more towards children and younger people. However, I love it. <laughs> I, I like when I'm hiking, I use Seek more than I use iNaturalist because it's very instant, especially if you're hiking and you have enough service to use it. So you can see there are the the icons are just a little bit bigger. Everything's a little bit more simple. And there's also these challenges that you can do and you can earn badges. Um, and if you click this down here, you will get, um, you will get, did I, what did I skip here? Oh, if you click this down here, you'll get this, uh, this uh, menu right here, which has home, the achievements where that your badges are, those different challenges. My observations is just like in iNaturalist, and then you can just straight up go to iNaturalist. Now, just like in iNaturalist, you click that cam green camera button at the middle bottom, and that will bring your camera up, and it's going to give you this, uh, just to remember to be 
nice to the to nature. And then when you make an observation, you don't even have to click the camera button. You don't even have to take a picture. It starts moving from kingdom, phylum, it goes down in taxonomic order. And this one got to genus species, it got to that last dot, convergent lady beetle, this is our lady beetle again. So it's ID'd it without even having to take a picture and wait to upload it to iNaturalist. Now, obviously, this is an extreme example because this is a very good picture. It's not moving, it's something just right in front of us. And we were able, the, the app was very easily be able to tell that it was the lady beetle. Uh, I can tell you from experience that Seek doesn't always get it right, but it is kind of cool because you can move your camera angles and try and get a little bit better ID. So if you have kids or you are someone like me that needs instant gratification, uh, Seek is a great app. Um, and when you observe a new species like this, this is one of those badges, this person found their first insect badge, so they got a bronze insect badge. Um, you can collect those badges and achievements. And then when you observe them, there's information that you can find here, and then you can post it immediately to iNaturalist. So totally syncs in very seamlessly with iNaturalist, just a little bit, just another little level there that you're getting that instant, instant at least attempt at an ID. So before Cynthia moves on to the second part where she's gonna talk about how to get good pictures, how to get good observations, and then what happens with our data, I'll give a couple seconds for anyone who, have, who has questions. And Cynthia, I'm going to give you control. Okay, I think we are ready to move on. So again, I'm Cynthia Scholl. Hi, everyone. I work at the UNR Museum of Natural History. My role there is mostly education. So the other role there is curation, where there's people who actually take care of the specimens and identify things. And I do a little bit of that, especially with some of the insects, but I really spend most of my time doing education and I work with all ages. I love working with, whoop. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> tried to I mute love, myself, but I'm still controlling it a little bit. <laughs> um, working with little kids, sometimes I work with preschoolers all the way up to adults. I, sometimes I still get to um, work with undergraduates and college kids, which I really enjoy. So <clears throat> I also founded Nevada Bugs and Butterflies, and we'll, you'll see lots of butterfly pictures. We'll talk more about butterflies as the talk goes on. So the first part of my um, <clears throat> presentation here is going to be hints about taking good photos. These are things that really make it easier for experts to help identify your photos. And then at the end, I'll talk a little bit about ways in which we as scientists can use iNaturalist data and how important it really is. So when you talk to a botanist, um, they will really want to see both the entire plant and a close-up. So here we have a golden current, and I took one photo of a whole plant, and then I made, to get, made sure to get up close and get photos of the flowers and leaves. Depending on what time of year it is, there may or may not be any reproductive structures on the plant. So if there are no seeds and no flowers, you'll really wanna get good pictures um, of, the, uh, <clears throat> of the leaves. But if there's flowers, get those. If there's seeds, get those. And I promise you talking to the uh, <clears throat> director of the herbarium, so that is the person who runs our plant collection at the UNR Museum of Natural History. He only <laughs> wants to look at things that have these two photos. So make sure to do that. 
here's just another example. This is an astragalus, um, a woolly milk fetch. And one photo I took with my shoe, so you can sort of get a sense of how big the whole plant is. And then I have a close up here of the flowers. For insects, when I get, when I try to take good butterfly photos, there is a butterfly hidden here. See if you can see it anywhere in this photo. I approach really slowly and I continuously take pi pictures. And so sometimes the insect flies away and I don't get a good photo, but sometimes I get lucky and I can really get up close, make sure I get a good shot. And so this turned out to be a thicket hair streak. And you can see it's proboscis out there. It's drinking from this. Um, this was in a roadside next to a stream in the Sweetwater Mountains. And so we have this um, thicket hair streak taking a drink there. It's important to have your photos in focus. Sometimes, you know, your phone is acting up. It's hard to do. So this was my first attempt to take a picture of these mating moths. And I tried again, I eventually got them in focus. So these are police car moths that I saw up in Jarbage, which was cool because we actually put them on a different community science platform and found out that this was one of the first sightings of this species in Nevada. So that was very exciting. And I was glad I took the time to get good photos. Okay, so here's a little quiz. What is different about this plant than the other ones I have shown? Give you a hint. This is cat mint. And it has something to do with some, what Julie mentioned earlier. And that is that this is a cultivated plant. And so again, you can put these on iNaturalist, but it's really not what iNaturalist was built for. They would like us to be identifying things in the wild. That really provides more information to biologists and community scientists. So you might really want to know what a cultivated plant is and you could still put it on iNaturalist. I would just try to be very respectful and immediately as I enter that observation check that it is captive or cultivated so that others know that. And that means that maybe, right, this plant is actually in my yard. Taking pictures in yards um, of plants is not as informative, but certainly taking pictures of pollinators on plants in yards is really informative. So if you see bees on plants in your garden or at a park, certainly put those on iNaturalist. We're going to switch gears here, and I'm going to talk about how I have used data on iNaturalist and how other scientists have done the same. So one of the ways that I use it is to find the food that caterpillars need to eat. You might have a guess of what kind of caterpillar this is here. We have a monarch caterpillar, and it's eating thin leaf milkweed. Western monarch populations are tumbling. There's almost, we've lost almost 99% of what used to be here for monarchs on the West Coast. So it is really important to document where milkweed populations are. And there's actually a graduate student who studies monarchs and milkweed at UNR. And I know that she has also used data from INAT to find new populations of milkweed and go out and survey it for monarchs. This is a very cute um, Becker's white caterpillar with these polka dots on a native prince's plume plant. Another quiz. <laughs> See if you have any guesses of what plant this is. I'll give you a hint and tell you that lots of caterpillars like to eat it, but also that it has silica spines, what glass is made of, and so, it might hurt you if you touch it. And that is because it is stinging nettle. Like I said, though, stinging nettle is actually wonderful food for caterpillars. So I have used iNaturalist to go out and find stinging nettle. Stinging nettle is often found in riparian areas. 
So along the Truckee River corridor, um, in the mountains here. And when I find stinging nettle, I look for caterpillars and I usually have luck in finding some. So there's three very common species of butterflies or fairly common species of butterflies around us that all use stinging nettle as caterpillars, as their host plant. And so up here in the um, upper left, we have a Milbert's tortoise shell. These are actually often gregarious as caterpillars. So you would find a whole bunch of the caterpillars on the plant at, at once. And it's a little hard to see here but the chrysalis is gold, which I think is just amazing. So the Milbert's tortoise shells have these gold chrysalis when they go through metamorphosis. Down at the bottom, we have a satyr comma. So that is uh, <clears throat> another butterfly that eats the nettle. This is a picture from Oxbow. So there at Oxbow Park, there's quite a bit of stinging nettle if you're up north in the Reno area. And um, <clears throat> you will also find quite a few of these satyr commas there. This is a red admiral, one of my favorite butterflies, a very um, widespread across the United States butterfly. It's actually uh, relatively uncommon in the Great Basin compared to other parts of the United States. And I have really only seen it in the far western uh, Great Basin in areas where there's quite a bit of stinging nettle. Mm -hmm. I'm having, oh, there we go. So next I would like to talk about some more serious um, science and how I naturalist has helped us understand butterfly declines across the Western United States. This is hot off the press information. So scientists communicate by, with each other by publishing papers. This paper was published just this year in March. And it was actually written by the person I studied under at UNR who is Dr. Matt Forrester. This is a picture of him. The second author is actually another board member too of Nevada Bugs and Butterflies. And so the authors of this paper use three different sources of citizen science or community science data to look at long-term population declines. It didn't have to be declines, but that's what they found in butterflies across the Western United States. So I don't want to overwhelm anyone tonight, but I thought we should look at a little bit of the findings from this paper, the actual data. And so we're going to really be concentrating on the green graphs because those are the ones from iNaturalist. So they had about 15 years of iNaturalist data in this paper. And we are looking here at graphs of time and how <clears throat> likely it is that they will see this butterfly. And so this one is called the West Coast Lady, uh, a sister species to the Painted Lady, if you're familiar with that species. And you can see the different colors are from different um, kinds of data. And you can see that all, through all three of those that we've seen declines in this um, butterfly. I will now put up a few more graphs and just tell you that this holds across um, all, pretty much all of the species that they looked at, which was 450 species of butterflies in the Western United States. They saw declines across almost all of them depend and they tried to understand if it was widespread ones were declining more, more localized ones, and they really found these declines across all species. So just if you're interested here, we have a um, California hair streak, a little copper butterfly, and if you know a skipper butterfly. Skippers often aren't um, thought of as butterflies sometimes until you learn a little bit more. And so they have a little bit fatter bodies. Sometimes they look like moths, but they are actually um, very fast, very hard to catch butterflies called skippers. And so the saddest thing from this paper was that the 
a big finding was that butterfly, Western butterflies are declining by about 1.6% a year. Every year we're losing that many. Um, the flip side or things that can help are that by planting the right plants to feed these butterflies, especially in the fall or times where they aren't getting the average rainfall that maybe they got in the past, we can hopefully help some of these species. And to tie it back into the talk today, just by documenting what you see, you are helping scientists and helping us understand the fate of these plants and animals that share our home with us. And so any observations that you put on iNaturalist are really important. One thing that I come back to a lot working in a museum is we often don't know what questions scientists will have in the future and what kind of data they'll need to answer them. But the more observations we put on iNaturalist, the better chance we have at documenting these things and helping future scientists be able to answer their questions. So with that, I am all done and I would love to take any questions that you may have. I'm taking control from you now. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Cynthia. That was so fascinating. Just seeing where the data is used and then all those little tips and tricks for getting the right pictures. I know I've been using iNaturalist for several years and never even thought of the quality of the photos. It never even occurred to me to be like, duh, the AI isn't going to identify for it for you. And then the experts that actually go in and look at it aren't gonna be able to identify it either. So thinking about the quality of the photos we get to help make that data better. And it looks like we've got one question. Okay, um, how can researchers access this data for their projects? Do they have to apply for special permissions to use it? That's a great question. So certainly when I'm looking for caterpillar host plants, I don't you know, apply to anyone to use that. I believe that in that paper, that Dr. Forrester wrote, they did communicate with iNaturalist to be able to use that data. But I, it is my understanding that iNaturalist makes that very easy for researchers because they want it to be used. Yeah, and I know on our side, having created projects and being able to see it, if you create your own project, it's very easy to see that data. Yes. Yes, I would say um, the question is, is the information publicly available? I would say yes, it is readily publicly available. Yeah, if you're if you're putting it into iNaturalist, you're agreeing that anyone can look at it. So anyone can can look at the data. You could even look at our project up to now and and see um, different numbers of observations and the kinds of things that have been seen. Yep, yep, definitely. Um, and oh, we got one more chat here. Let's see. Cool, thank you. That's okay. Let's. <laughs> uh, so before we leave, though, I do want to encourage everyone to join the Summer Nevada Nature Blitz. It's so fun to get out there. It's so fun to use this app. It's just another good excuse to get outside. We're also doing a June wild 30 30 wild challenge we're challenging you to get outside every single day in june and submit a photo to our naturalist and we will have other challenges we just finished up a challenge that was a plant diversity the most species of plants and we had two winners and we're sending them real life prizes they are getting prizes so you can win prizes and just on june 1st June was declared National Get Outdoors Month. 
So there's no excuse. There's so many reasons to get outside. Um, if you're in Reno, it's really, really hot, but I looked at the forecast. It's supposed to cool down a little bit. So there's so many reasons to get outside and we will keep doing webinars similar to this covering different species, um, more or less once a week, give or take a couple weeks. Um, to get people involved and we'll have guests from our partners like Bugs and Butterflies and the Natural History Museum and Truckee Meadows Parks Foundation is going to have some uh, park walks as well. So please keep an eye out for any of those. Anything you want to add before we go, Cynthia? No, just thanks so much for coming tonight. Yes, thank you so much for coming and thank you, Cynthia. This was awesome. This will be up on YouTube. Um, in a couple weeks or so. Have a good night, everyone. Bye.